Hello, we are back at the Extension Office. My name is Angie Huddle. I'm a registered nurse at Purdue, the um, healthcare specialist, and I'm here with another special guest again, Mr. Steve. Um, Steve, tell us who you are, what you do, and your credentials. Okay, good morning to everybody. My name is Steve English. Uh, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I have a private practice in Hartford, Kentucky, as well as I do uh, uh, work at the Wellness Center at Purdue with Angie. And uh, I've been a nurse practitioner for 15 years. Before that, I was previously a, a RN for 21 years. Before that, I uh, had the good fortune to work for about 16 years on air medical rescue helicopters at the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville in Cosairs Children's Hospital in Louisville. Uh, before that, I worked at the uh, University of Kentucky with a background in ICU and uh, emergency department nursing. and. Uh, now I uh, uh, try. To, I've gotten older, so I've slowed the pace down a little bit, and it's uh, it's quite enjoyable to me. That's a long list. Well, it is, but it, it makes for an interesting business card. You know, you kind of have to make trifold business cards. You got so much junk written. I love it. it. I love <laughs> it. I know you're my go-to when I have questions for sure. So we're not here um, just to talk about how wonderful you are. We're here to talk about a sp special subject that is really important to all of us not just certain people, we all need to worry about this. Yes, we're going to talk about diabetes today and more specifically diabetes type 2. Um, it's uh, near and dear to my heart. I've always been interested in it because of the, the mysterious nature of the disease along with the fact that now uh, I will just give a little fact or two about myself. I had open heart surgery four and a half years ago and uh, after I had surgery I became a type 2 diabetic and so it is very personal to me now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, what is type 2 diabetes? Type 2 diabetes uh, is, a, is a disease that is I would say rampant in our in our culture in the United States first thing. So what, what I would like to do if it's okay I'd like to kind of preface uh, answering your question by stating the fact that some things that we probably already know in that in the United States we are facing about a 63 percent of the population that is obese now. Uh, we also have a population that is very carbohydrate oriented. We can go and buy a, a five gallon bucket full of french fries cheaper than we can buy a small piece of chicken or a small piece of steak uh, at the grocery store. Yeah. So everything seems to be bigger and better, but it also has more and more carbohydrates. And this seems to be the, uh, uh, one of the problems with our culture. Uh, where I'm going with this is that type 2 diabetes is a disease that develops in the human body. Uh, people in general are not born with type 2 diabetes. They are born with type 1 diabetes, which I will touch on in a little, a little bit later. Uh, but what happens is our body, the, the, the crux of the disease is that our body becomes so inundated with carbohydrates that our body just begins to sense them as a toxin. And so then uh, we still take carbohydrates in every day, but our body refuses to, to burn them as an energy source. And so they, they basically get stored in the body. So with that, carbohydrates, I use that as a, a catch-all term to include starches, breads, potatoes, pastas, and sugars, which we all know what sugars are. Mm -hmm. But all of those together, and they build up in the system, they're not burned as energy. And so then as we draw blood on people, or if we check their blood, that blood sugar level goes up and up and up until they reach the threshold before they become a, a type 2 diabetic. Now generally, you will also see with that a small amount of dysfunction in the pancreas. You will lose about 25 to 30 percent of the function of your pancreas, and that's what will, uh, that, that just goes along with it being overwhelmed with carbohydrates. And uh, then you'll reach that threshold where you become a diabetic and you have to be treated. So Steve, let me clarify. You are telling me that if I eat better foods that I do not have, wouldn't have the risk of type 2 diabetes? Well, if that's true. If we ate a balanced meal, if we ate a more balanced meal every time we ate, if we ate less food at a time 
and probably ate more frequently during the day. And I think most importantly, above all else, is, is if we would include activity in our, uh, in our daily life. Yes, I think we could definitely stave off. There's, there are some uh, uh, medical textbooks even that will tell you that er everyone will become a type 2 diabetic if they live long enough. I'm not sure that that's not an outdated statement now. I think that people have the knowledge and the availability that with uh, good nutritional habits and activity levels, yes, I think we can stave off type 2 diabetes. You know, that is really sad to think about that because the statistics that I read that says is one in three people are pre-diabetic and Correct. one in ten don't even know that. Correct. Yes, that, that, that's the thing. There's, 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 there is kind of a, uh, uh, an, old, an old wives tale, if you will, in, in medicine that if your sugar goes up or if it's in the process of going up, you'll really never notice it. You know, your body will be fine with it. It's, it's no, you know, it's nothing that overwhelms you. It's nothing that drives you to seek medical help. It, if your blood sugar drops down and bottoms out, I think we probably all have heard horror stories about people sure, that have that sure. happen. And you really do get sick from that. But yes, you can move from uh, no diabetes whatsoever to borderline or pre-diabetes all the way into diabetes and really never never notice anything that's going on. Now, the, the one thing that people will notice if they're sensitive to it, you will develop quite a, a, a large uh, thirst, which we call uh, uh, polydipsia, and that means just you want to drink water, whatever, all the time, and you'll increase the amount of times you urinate every day, which we call polyuria, and those are the two things that if we get complaints of that, we'll automatically check them for diabetes. You know, and then we have people that come to us and say, that's not right. I, I feel fine. I'll be fine. My, my parents were diabetic, but I'm fine. So what do we tell to these people, you know, try to convince them, hey, this is a problem? Well, one of the things that I tell people, and, and I, I've, I've been there, I've done it myself, because I think healthcare workers may be some of the worst patients Absolutely. ever. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, I, I do tell people if they're receptive to a little bit of off-the-cuff type uh, uh, comments, I always tell them that denial is a big river in Egypt. You know, we can't have that. You know, we, you, you, can, you can blow it off and you can ignore it, but I can promise you that because of the scar I have on my chest, it will not go away. Healthcare problems are healthcare problems, and, uh, and I can tell you in general uh, that healthcare providers are not in the habit of making up diseases just so they can have a reason to treat their patients. Right. So if you're borderline, uh, my best advice would be to take advantage of the things that are available all the way from health departments to to where we are today, to the uh, primary care providers, and and utilize the resources that they have to help you. You know, even and nutritionists also. I have to bring them into the fray Absolutely. because they can help immensely. Yes. So, um, what would be one way that you could find out whether or not you are diabetic? Well, at, any, at almost any uh, uh, health department, at any almost any urgent care. Uh, certainly at our uh, uh, primary care in Hartford that we have, certainly at the uh, wellness clinic at Purdue, uh, almost any clinic that I know of will be glad to check your blood sugar into a finger stick. Uh, of course, they're going to have to poke the end of your finger with a small needle, but it's, it's very painless to tell the truth about mm -hmm. it. Uh, and then and, and besides that, you have a red badge of courage to show your friends after it's over <laughs> with. But, but that will tell you, and, uh, and uh, to get a little more uh, further into it, you know, you, we kind of have a uh, guideline that if, if, you're, if you've not eaten in eight hours, uh, our magic number is 126. If, you're, if your blood sugar is 126 or above after fasting for eight hours, or if your blood sugar is 200 or above at any time, then that would be very suspicious for diabetes. Wow. So when your grandma grabs you to check your sugar, you've got a good uh, indication of where it should or should not be, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and, uh, and, and you know, I've even had people come in and say, well, I used, I used grandma's uh, sugar mm -hmm. checker, and I, I know I'm not supposed to do that. And I said, well, I don't know who's, you know, that's not exactly <laughs> like taking grandma's pain pills. Right. So, I mean, it's, no, there's no harm, no foul, I think. Mm -hmm. And like I say, at, at any clinic, you know, I think they would be more than happy to check your blood sugar for you at any at any time.
So let's say they find out, yes, mine is in an area of concern. What are some things that they can do? Well, the one thing that they would need to do is get under the care of a primary care uh, provider, be that a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, or, or a, a medical doctor. Uh, you know, we have specialists, endocrinologists, that specialize in thyroid and diabetes, but uh, that usually is reserved for the, the extremely difficult cases that are hard to take care of. And all, all family practice and internal medicine specialists are, are trained at a level to, uh, to uh, take care of and treat uh, diabetes type 2 especially. And so I would seek out one of those people and uh, get them to help you with it uh, because it is a very multifaceted treatment. Uh, you know, you can go and uh, as we say, in, as people talk about medicine, you can throw pills at it or you can try to take a little more holistic type approach to it and in, in involve the activity level and the diet and the nutrition and if need be the medicine. And uh, it's just a whole, basically what I'm trying to say is it's a whole lifestyle change. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and, and those folks are, are versed in helping you with it. So you talked about the endocrinologist, and that's a special. Isn't that more of a type one diabetes? That is, and again, that, that's a, a, a thank you for the segue. That'll lead me into type <laughs> one diabetes. Type one diabetes. To clarify, uh, the old adage was that type one diabetes is needle diabetes. Type two diabetes is pill diabetes. Mm -hmm. Type one diabetes is what we find in a young person, anywhere from birth to usually five or six years old, that is born and has almost zero pancreas function. Mm -hmm. So they're a person that does not produce insulin at all and they are going to be saddled with having to uh, provide their own insulin by an injection every day. Although the latest news out there, I know uh, about five years ago they tried to introduce a nasally inhaled insulin. Uh, it failed miserably. It didn't do very well. But there is uh, uh, now there is a uh, two products on the market that will probably come out within the next year or two: a pill type diabetes, a, a pill type insulin, and another nasal inhale type yeah. insulin are available. But these people are going to be on an insulin product for their entire life. Versus a, uh, and, and these are people that would be more likely to be treated by the endocrinologist. This is more of a specialized uh, situation, and you may have heard of people that have an insulin pump or that they have a, a small device on their belt, <clears throat> like a beeper, mm -hmm. that will provide them through a, a, a little a patch that they have on their abdomen, will actually read their blood sugar and provide them with the amount of insulin they need as the day goes along. They don't have to stop and load a syringe with insulin and give themselves an injection three or four times a day. So it, it technology is really involving itself, mm -hmm. So, but, but that's the situation that, a, that an endocrinologist, a specialist would handle. So the type 1 would um, change in their diet and activity, would that make that go away? That, no, doubtful. That's, that, that's never going to go away. It may be able to, you may be able to control it much, much more. But uh, again, type 1 diabetes is more of a congenital situation where someone is mm -hmm. born and they have poor pancreas function. And that's really never, we really don't have any treatment or medicine that will actually increase the function of, of the pancreas to a level where they will not be dependent on insulin. Now, let me address that further by saying that is it controllable? Yes. Uh, we have incidences of people that have taken seven, eight insulin shots a day and with a commitment to diet and exercise, uh, you can bring that down to where they take one shot a day. And certainly, wow. if, yeah, from, from nothing else, I have a, a very close personal friend that we did the very same thing with him from seven shots to one shot a day. Wow. And uh, just in terms of money alone. Absolutely. That was Mike Wagg's question, yeah. yeah. And, That's got to uh, save them a lot of money. Yes, it, because insulin is, uh, if you watch the news, I know that you've probably seen that there's quite a controversy right now over the actual price of insulin. Uh, insulin, uh, when I started in healthcare 33 years ago, uh, most of them were ch very cheap. I mean, you could buy insulin for uh, a $20 bill would get really? you a, a month or two months worth of insulin. Wow. And now the, I have people that w they say that their insurance is wanting to charge them $600 for the very same insulin that cost $20 30 years ago. I, I, I have a hard time really digesting that fact. I don't really understand how they can, you know, uh, validate that, but it, I suppose it is the truth. It, and, and some of the newer 
uh, longer lasting, longer lasting insulins, what we call the basal insulins that last for 24 hours. Now, some of those are quite expensive, okay. and they have been from the time onset into the market to the present time. But uh, uh, it, it's quite an expensive undertaking. So the type one is insulin dependent. Now you hear of the type two that's insulin dependent as well. So Correct. what's the difference there? Difference is that uh, again, going back to my definition earlier, when you lose about 25 to 30 percent of your pancreas function, uh, which means your insulin production is going to be less, you will go on uh, some sort of appeal or combination of pills to try to uh, bolster that and make sure that your body digests and metabolizes carbohydrates better so that they do not build up in your bloodstream and then eventually build up around your uh, midline because they do eventually become abdominal fat which mm -hmm. is another that, that leads us into our obesity statistic from earlier but uh, some people will uh, uh, gradually decrease from about a 30 percent loss of pancreas function down to where they'll lose about 70 to 75 percent of their pancreas wow. function mostly due to time but again non-compliance uh, not paying attention to your provider not seeking out a provider uh, being very uh, 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 non-compliant or careless with your diet, uh, getting absolutely no exercise whatsoever, all those things will accelerate this decrease in pancreas function because as your blood sugar goes up, your pancreas function goes down. So once you get to that level where you've lost about 75% of your pancreas function, they will indeed have to go on insulin. Hmm. So um, as a nurse, I, of course I see a lot of people with type 2 diabetes and I do hear a lot of them say things like, it's okay, um, I have my Diet Coke and my candy bar that kind of cancel each other out, it's okay, I'll just cover it with my insulin. So what are they practicing here? Well, they're, again, we're back to the big river in Egypt. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a denial of actually what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So you have a Diet Coke. Okay, all's well and good. Well, of course, that brings its own set of controversies up, too. People mm -hmm. uh, say that uh, Diet Coke turns into formaldehyde in your body. I don't know oh, that there's any, any truth in that whatsoever, but I've, I've seen that on the uh, one of the Internet sites. But, uh, but to add a candy bar to that, uh, there is no canceling out. Once you introduce a large bolus of sugar into your body, mm -hmm. it again, it's, you know, whether you drank a, a Diet Coke with it or you drank a, 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 a glass of water with four tablespoons of sugar in it, it's just, you're still adding sugar to your diet with the candy bar. An overload of it, too much of it, and suddenly, can people with type 2 diabetes never have a candy bar? That's not exactly that, but, but again, it comes to good nutritional planning, and if you're going to offset something, then if you're going to have a piece of pie, you know, if mom bakes a pecan pie and mm -hmm. you're just dying for a piece, sure. have a piece, <laughs> but then for the next couple of meals, you need to kind of tone it down a little bit on the carbohydrates and let your body kind of come back to a, uh, uh, a more of a healthy point with your blood sugar. Perfect. I did um, speak with one gentleman, and he was in that denial at a, a long period of time and then he got to the point where he was like oh this is this is something i need to pay attention to and then he said he started out with because he really loves sweet tea so he would do half sweet tea half water and then he would incorporate more and more salads and then he realized you know mother's pie i i don't need that every supper maybe just on sunday supper and he realized just a little bit of changes and stuff and it made his a1c really drop See, that's, I think, uh, that's an extremely good point, Angie. I think that's what we call the aha moment mm -hmm. in healthcare, and it's one of the things that keeps you getting up and coming to work every morning. Uh, when you do have that happen, it's, you know, it's like this uh, epiphany, and, uh, and, and again, this is what we strive for. We try to get this into people's heads, but again, you're trying to change cultural norms of yeah. like, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, I can go to, uh, uh, certain fast food restaurants and you know they actually have uh, a huge you can get not large but huge french fries you know mm -hmm. or gigantic french fries or a uh, five, smothered in cheese yeah or, 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 or a gallon bucket full of sweet tea and they'll yeah. throw it in free with three pieces of pie with it i mean our culture is just dictating that these cheaper uh, food groups the carbohydrates are readily available but yet they are slowly uh 
causing disease processes and dare I say even shortening our lives because mm. of that. Mm. Wow. So Steve, um, tell us if I came to you and said, you know, I need to check my, what would you run me through? Well, the first thing I would do is just ask, I'd go through, I'd try to go through a good history and physical first, ask you questions about how, uh, subjectively how you feel, how you've been feeling, have there been any changes in uh, any of your physical uh, parameters in the past, you know, six months or so. And again, if this polyuria, polydipsia, the, the urge to drink a lot more and the urge to pee a lot more comes to the forefront, then we certainly would do some uh, lab work where we would check your blood sugar uh, uh, at that point in time. Plus, we have the option to do a, by blood test a, a test called hemoglobin A1C, which is a bit of a godsend to the healthcare profession mm -hmm. in the fact that it uh, will uh, it goes to the hemoglobin molecule and reads four months previous history of the of what the person's glucose has averaged right. or what their blood sugar has averaged. Uh, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but what it tells us is uh, you have that patient that will come, because I have been, uh, I've had this scenario mm -hmm. where one single patient would come and tell you that he's been to his daughter's wedding uh, 11 or 12 times, correspondingly every time that you check his blood sugar the night before he was at his daughter's wedding reception and they had some punch and some cake and that's why his blood sugar's up today. <laughs> and at one point in time, you know, really that's all we had. You know, we had to go with that, although I was pretty sure he didn't have 11 daughters, so I, you know, I kind of was suspicious from that. But then along comes the hemoglobin A1C and it sort of takes the, uh, 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 if you will, telling fibs about their diet. Uh, yeah. It kind of takes that out of yeah. it because it tells you uh, every day, 24-7, what the sugar has averaged for, for up to four months. And it, it really helps. Of course, the other things you would do, you would look at uh, kidney function, liver function, uh, uh, electrolytes and things because again, uh, diabetes does have an effect on many different parameters and functions of the body and uh, you would have to take all those into, into account. So what kind of A1C would you be truly concerned about? The guidelines now is we want to keep uh, the hemoglobin A1C. It has kind of a strange number and I'll explain that. We want to keep the A1C at 7.0 or less. Uh, some just few years ago we were shooting for a number of 6.0 or less. It was found by research to show that that causes more uh, terminal cardiovascular events such mm -hmm. as heart attacks and strokes so the number came up to seven and uh, we seem to be doing quite well with that and that if you convert that over that converts to an average of about 146 to 148 as an average throughout the day so what that would tell you is in the morning fasting that would be around 110 to 120 and then after a big meal it would be like 160 170 and that's certainly doable that's something we can live with and all the research which it's myriad what they've done that with the a1c of 7.0 it shows us that uh, vascular changes the problems long term that diabetes causes are almost at zero whenever we stay 7.0 or below on our hemoglobin a1c so this is for diabetic diabetic person yes. not the not for the person that walks off the street that would not be now if you if you wanted to uh, verify that a person was not a diabetic then you would look for a hemoglobin a1c somewhere in the 5.5 range or below okay. and that you know you so can, that's what we want our target to be yes that's yes. not diabetic because remember as we said earlier we are looking for that fasting blood sugar of uh, below 126 so you know to, to get in that range you would want a you would want an a1c to be 5.5 uh, or so to, to be sure that you have a fasting of, of you know say 110 and then after a big meal maybe 135 or 140 and that's that's where with anything that's in the fours or the fives is going to pretty much put you in the non-diabetic category. Okay. okay. So if I come to you and we've checked it and you said, Angie, your A1C is over seven. So what are you going to do for me? First thing I'm going to do before anything else 
is uh, after, like I say, after we look, do the history and physical, uh, I'm going to determine if with a physical, do you have anything that looks like it's going to cause a problem? Do your eyes look uh, like there's any damage in your eyes? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not, an, I'm not an optometrist and certainly not an ophthalmologist, but I can look in uh, uh, with an ophthalmoscope at the back of the eye and see if there's any vascular changes, any, any big blockages in the vessels in the back of the eye or any hemorrhages in the back of the eye. And that would tell us that, yes, you have an A1C that's diabetic and yes, you have some damages into your eyes. So in this case, we would certainly be aggressive about starting medicine, but more importantly, uh, really coming at you hard with lifestyle changes to try to get your diet under control and, and get some activity. In now, are life. you saying if my sugar is too high and I'm type two diabetes, this can affect my eyes? Oh yeah, yes. We have again with that with that A one C of seven point zero. Once we go above that, uh, we begin to have micro what they call microvascular changes. Simply means the small blood vessels in the body begin to become damaged. These include, uh, I think, probably in possibly in order of uh, importance, the eyes. We can have uh, diabetic-based uh, macular degeneration, mm. uh, which is is going to render you. If you live long enough, it will render you blind in both eyes, mm. uh, and certainly before that, certainly damage your uh, vision to a to a large degree. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, damage to the kidneys. The kidneys have very small blood vessels in them and we can, uh, people because of diabetes can eventually go into kidney failure. Mm. Uh, you've all heard horror stories of people that lose their, begin to lose their toes and their feet because yes. of lack of circulation and again these are the smaller blood vessels and it can happen in the fingers as well as the toes and uh, certainly uh, the lining of the stomach can be involved and uh, actually uh, microvascular uh, small blood vessels in the brain can even be and there there are certain types of dementia that can be uh, uh, manipulated by uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Wow, so you give me the uh, diagnosis of diabetes and then um, you talked about the feet so what things can I do as a diabetic to watch about my feet? This is, this is again almost another discipline into itself. Of course, uh, the people that are family practice, that is people that have more of a broad spectrum of, uh, of uh, knowledge about disease processes versus specialized, uh, that's part of your lifestyle change. Uh, not just, you know, you're gonna become active, but you're also gonna watch your feet at the same time because uh, anything that we do to harm the feet if uh, even if you have good control of your diabetes, uh, if you wear uh, poorly fitting shoes uh, that cause friction on the side of the shoes and build up callus, uh, that can cause pressure within the foot, decrease the circulation, and even with maintaining your sugar uh, at a good level, then you can still cause problems by having poorly fitting feet or walking around barefooted and, and getting punctures in your feet because again uh, one thing we haven't touched on yet but it'll just I'll just throw it out here is uh, diabetes is going to slow the healing process on anything uh, whether you cut yourself shaving your face or you uh, are wearing ill-fitting shoes or if you wear no shoes and step on something and puncture your foot so again you run the risk of, of vascular damage, blood vessel damage into the feet from the diabetes and then when you add an injury or an illness to that foot uh, which is slow to heal uh, you may end up with some very 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 extreme damage which may cost you your foot uh, just because of something as slight as stepping on a, a sharp object in a cut that you know, if you're not diabetic, it would be three days and it would heal up. And in a diabetic person, they may have to go to a wound specialist and have that treated and, and then eventually <clears throat> still have to have a, lose a toe or something over it. Absolutely. I know. I, I'm sure you've took care of many, many, but I have one particular, I had one, and he said, I've got just this little blister that wear on these on the back of my foot where I was mowing the yard. And then as days went by, it just got worse and worse and worse. And so that's definitely something else they have to really watch very close for. Well, well it is, and, and again, like we say, you know, uh, any of us would, would, would do that and have a blister come up on our feet, and I'm sure we all have, and you're saying, oh, well, that's going to hurt for a mm -hmm. day or two, and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and as you say, I, I have one male patient at the present time that went to wound care for about three months 
got a blister healed up and went right back to wearing ill-fitting shoes, got a blister on the lower, great toe of the other foot, mm -hmm. and he's been back in wound care now for about three weeks and uh, uh, at, at a huge cost. And, yeah, very uh, expensive. Yeah, and, 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 and eventually if this trend keeps up, you know, I really hate to think where it's going to go because it, it's going it, to—it will not get better if he doesn't decide to, to do something to try to improve. So, but but now in 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 the other side of that is there are uh, manufacturers out there that do uh, manufacture what we call diabetic shoes, and yes. those are shoes that are meant to be very well fitting. They do not cause friction points. They have a lot of support on the on the insoles of the shoes. And insurance, uh, especially Medicare, is uh, is very good about providing those for diabetic patients. Good. So, Steve, what would be some things that you would say? Listen, Angie, I need you to turn your life around, and these are key points. Okay. With speaking with somebody, I would try. I would try to let them know that one, you need to eat a more balanced meal every time you sit down at a meal, and yes, you have to think about it and know the days of just going and eating everything that our fast food restaurants have to offer is pretty much behind you. You know, you had you had your fun and now you're <laughs> gonna have to get serious. Yeah. And but but with that, the it's not that you have to dream up all this stuff and suddenly, you know, go to find medical textbooks and, and read all that dry and boring stuff to try to learn this information. The 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 information is so unbelievable that's available to you. The internet again does have its good points, and mm -hmm. the American Diabetes Association, uh, the American College of Endocrinologists, uh, several different places have uh, oh just endless recipes, endless meal plans. Along with locally, you know, you have your uh, 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 health departments and such, and and uh, family care providers. I have I just received. Uh, as a matter of fact, yesterday and the day before yesterday, like four boxes from FedEx that were just full of teaching materials, very well put together teaching materials. It was done by one pharmaceutical company. I won't plug them right now, but <laughs> I have to say it was done through the American Diabetes Association yeah. with their blessing. So it's it's done well. It's easily readable. It's not like reading a medical textbook. It's it's kind of set up in kind of a fun way and it will really teach you these different uh, aspects of, of eating smaller portions, eating more balanced protein fats and carbohydrates versus all carbohydrates and uh, when to eat and how to eat and that would be the one thing that I would do and then the other thing that I would do is ask, just try to, <coughs> excuse me, try to coax them into some activity level and with that uh, I, I may jump ahead here and say yes, it's like well I can't, well my knees hurt. Well, my feet hurt. Mm -hmm. Well, my back hurts. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, it's raining outside. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> you know, or it's Tuesday. I'm not going Yeah, trust me, I've used them all. I, yeah, I know them all. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is, what I tell people is like, I say, can you walk for five minutes? And very few people are going to tell you that they can't, cannot walk for yeah. five minutes. Yeah. And I say, okay, do this. Just walk out the front door. Well, don't, I don't care how far you walk. Just look at your watch and walk for five minutes and turn around and walk back. I said, that's 10 minutes. I said, then in a week or so of doing that, two weeks, walk for seven and a half minutes mm. and then that'll be 15. And just start out like that because here's the big takeaway from this. Walking is probably one of the best exercises you can ever do. Swimming may be probably better, but then again, having access to the pool mm. is an option is mm. that we may not all have. But walking, we pretty much all can do that, you right, know, right. And, and it's a low impact, so it's not going to damage the joints, it's not going to cause you trauma up into your spine and things, and it also increases the metabolism enough that it will help your body to burn the carbohydrates, and it will actually help to burn some abdominal fat that's on your body, which is going to all lead to your blood sugar getting better. Wow. Well, we're all looking for, you're talking about, you're kind of getting in that area where we're losing weight. And everybody's looking for that magic pill, so there's really not a magic pill, is there? There's not a magic pill. There, there's a not. I mean, we have appetite suppressants that are based on amphetamines. Well, I mean, you know, so again, why not just go out on the street and buy some of this meth that these nice uh, backyard pharmacists are cooking up? <laughs> 
uh, you know, I mean, I'm being a little sarcastic there, but still, the, the amphetamines may cause you to lose some weight due to appetite suppression, but they're, they're burning your heart and your blood vessels up at the same time. So it's a balancing act. Now, we do have some new uh, interesting diabetes pills that are on the market that do have a claim of weight loss and seems to be very uh, uh, truthful in what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But again, we're talking 5%. And so if you're talking, you know, obviously if you're talking a 200 pound person, you're talking 10 pounds. Now, 10 pounds is good, but again, rarely are we talking about a 200 pound person. When we, right. You know, we're usually we're talking more in the 300 pound range. And we're, you know, obviously we're talking 15 pounds. While 15 pounds is good, it's not the panacea that you need when they need to lose 100 pounds of body weight. Uh, but it is, it, it truly is, it's something that we use, but then again, these are newer pills, they are very expensive pills, and then it's a matter of getting insurance to cover these pills. Right. So do you have anything else about diabetes? I guess if I was going to say one thing about diabetes, anything, and this is just my belief, this is truly not in the medical textbooks, I would say the most important thing, get up off the couch, go walk somewhere if you just walk around inside the house if it's if it's raining get walk move get some steps under your belt during the day and don't sit around because that's your worst worst enemy in this thing uh, you can bring people almost completely off medicine if they will and maybe even off medicine if wow. they will do activity wow so tell us again where you're at if they want to come see you as a provider. If they want to come see me, I have a full-time practice, practice in Hartford, Kentucky at Ohio County Family Care. And I also uh, work uh, one day a week at uh, the wellness clinic at Purdue and have a lot of fun doing it. So please come <laughs> see me. Thank you so much, Steve. I always enjoy visiting with you. And my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. You.